Okay, so welcome everybody. So I'm happy to host Steven Folder with us. Um, Steven, a very kind human being <coughs> and a Dharma teacher, a uh, very um, old and matured and senior Dharma teacher. And we're going to talk about uh, today, we're going to talk about the um, situation in Israel Palestine. Uh, the war, humanity, uh, the place of Dharma within all this. Um, yeah, so we're going to have just now five minutes of meditation guided by Stephen. Then we're going to have a discussion, mostly uh, Stephen and I. And um, if we, if anybody has questions, you can write them, and I will uh, choose the the ones I see. If we can. And we're having this, uh, although we're all Hebrew speakers, we're having this meeting in English. So uh, the recording can go out also abroad. And, yeah. Okay, Stephen, to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Asaf, and thank you for the invitation, um, which I appreciate. Uh, kind of a personal invitation. And uh, yes, I would like to just to start by. Firstly, feeling ourselves together, just a moment of feeling connected, all of us together, never mind Zoom, never mind how we see each other or we don't see each other, but just a sense in the heart that we are together here. And we're together for a purpose. We're together in order to inquire, in order to explore, in order to uh, feel ourselves in the mystery and the difficulty of existence. So just take this moment to feel together. And from that place, we can maybe come to our presence. If we want, we can close our eyes. Collect ourselves. Gather ourselves. Feeling fully here with whatever situation we're in right now. The sounds, the weight of the body, The feeling of, I'm aware, I'm here. Let it touch the heart as well. It is good to be here right now, connecting to ourselves, listening, Remembering. Feeling our big soul, our big being that we are. The sense that this moment is the truth. There is a truth in it. The truth of our being here and now. Whatever arises is the truth of this moment. Just allow that. Welcome it.
And we can get a sense that as much as we're connected to our inner truth, to our big, the big being that we are, that much we will be able to help others, ourselves, and contribute something in the challenges of daily life. Coming from this place of authentic presence, it's the ground of our power to help others. Okay, and let's take a deep breath and open the eyes, but staying with that sense of presence, that sense of we are gathered, uh, we gather ourselves here. Okay, so uh, I'm very happy to meet you all. And as I say, this is an invitation from Asaf. And basically, I'm going to um, give the floor to Asaf to ask me anything. Um, I have to say that what I will say is very much, in this form, very much personal. I don't expect, I'm not here representing, Tovana representing uh, a particular view or a particular group or a particular uh, situation or organization or anything like that. Um, that's the invitation from myself and, and I'm really happy for that is, is just to have a dialogue. What, where, where am I? Where am I? <laughs> where is this Stephen in all of this? And, and so there'll be some honesty um, and I don't expect you to agree or whatever. I don't expect anything, uh, but I do appreciate that um, you're listening and are giving me the opportunity just to express the way I see things at this, at this time. So uh, yes, Asaf, over to you. You can ask me what you want. have a very simple question for the beginning and that's how are you these days hmm. uh, feel free to have a, like a complex uh, um, answer I'm sure simple that, question I'm sure that like any of us in Israel now you're experiencing more than one thing. Yeah, indeed. Thank you. So I have to say, um, I'm happy. <laughs> uh, I'm happy these days. I'm happy for this precious life. Every day I wake up at five o'clock in the morning and I'm ready for the day. I feed the chickens. I live my day. 
um, which is uh, pretty well as I've been living it so many years. Um, but that happiness of me as a person doesn't mean that I don't feel the big weight and the pain of what's happening right now. I feel it in my heart. I feel it, it comes as waves during the day. Whenever there are booms and bangs of the artillery of Israel firing on Lebanon, and sometimes uh, rockets from Lebanon coming to where I am in the north of Israel, um, I feel pain at that time. I actually don't feel any fear. I have only once or twice I, I can remember being uh, personally afraid, feeling fear, and I work with it in the Dharma sense. And that was really at the beginning of this, like two months ago. I don't feel fear, but I feel such a sadness and so much pain that is happening. Every shell that is fired from an Israeli gun that falls somewhere on some village, on some people, and every rocket coming from Lebanon falling somewhere in Kiryat Shmone or wherever it does, and damaging and hurting and, and, and the soldiers on both sides. So I feel a lot of that, um, that pain. I feel it in the body. And um, it's a kind of a, something like uh, I, I, I can't digest. It's something like eating stones and it feels like inside there. It doesn't stop the happiness of my daily life. I do feel, you know, uh, but that's the emotional tone that um, arises. And um, I also feel a mourning, hitablut in Hebrew. I feel mourning. And I feel mourning for the huge amount of death and destruction that's going on, not just personally in the north, but of course in the beginning in south, in in the um, uh, in outside Gaza, the uh, death, destruction, and uh, terrible things that happened on October the seventh, and then the terrible things that continued to happen since then um, in in Gaza. And uh, I feel a mourning. I, I feel that I'm mourning. And it's not only mourning for the death and the destruction and the, 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 the terrible suffering going on, but also mourning that illu the illusion, mourning the sense of illusion that somehow or other we keep sleepwalking <laughs> into more war and into more disaster. It's as if we're all sleepwalking. And to me, that is very painful. Um, so all these feelings, I'm talking about the feelings, they're all there, to, as you say, it's complex and mixed. Um, and uh, um, there's a great, you know, there's this sadness and so on and mixed with just the preciousness of this life, which I feel, you know, in, in every moment. Uh, so the two go together and they're wo woven together in the kind of uh, tapestry, the, the picture of now and of my emotional life. So, uh, uh, question regarding that morning, do you feel for you, do you ha have any uh, difference when you hear about like pain coming from Israelis or Palestinians? Really personally, do you feel any? How does it how does it touch you? Because I know for many of us in Israel, we have this we have our identity connected to being in Israel. But you were actually in, you were not born here, and you practice Dharma, which is very deep talking about uh, emptiness and maybe going out of personal identity. 
So I really wonder how it is when you hear about what is happening. Okay, so here I'm going to be a bit honest. <laughs> um, and um, I have to say that um, at the beginning, especially when there was so much anger, I really understood the anger. But as time went on and death and destruction increased in, in, in Gaza, I began to feel a bit of a lonely voice. And I felt that there was a certain consensus around. I'm not talking about people that I met in the street in Nahariya that said, we have to smash them. We have to wipe them out. We have to smash uh, the, the people. Uh, Aza. We, we... I'm even talking about something which is more, um, not so extreme, but generally a feeling of we have to sort them out. We need to uh, we can't carry on unless we wipe out Hamas and there's something fundamental about that statement that I'm getting I was getting from everybody almost that made me feel quite lonely that there was a consensus that was so strong and um, <clears throat> I felt that there that that uh, at, I have to say at the beginning of, um, and, and even today, in a way, in Clil, people said to me, well, you're from outside. You're not from here. You don't know what it's like to be. <laughs> well, I've been here 40 years. And actually, I've been here through probably more wars in Israel than many of you and experiencing them. So I've been around here. And, and the living in Israel has not reduced that view of the sameness of human life, whichever side of the border it is. I, feel, I felt that right at the beginning. Of course I cried and I, was, I felt at the beginning in October the 7th, this terrible pain of what was going on there. But I, I, the other day I was reading um, uh, Eamon, Aud, Aud, Eamon, Eamon Ode, who was writing in Haaretz and he said, Anyone that feels that the life and the well-being of an Israeli child and a Palestinian child is exactly the same needs to go out on the street and shout it. And I did feel like that. I needed to go out the street and shout it. But to be honest, I, I, uh, I didn't shout it very much <laughs> because uh, I felt a little bit like, well, who I didn't. I felt there was such a strong consensus and um, I was getting some ricochets, which I don't mind. It's okay for people to be angry with me if I think differently. I'm really okay with that. Uh, but I felt a bit lonely at times because the consensus was so strong called we cannot keep, we have to smash them because there's no other way. And I had a very, very strong view that says, what happened on October the 7th is a call for waking up. It's not a call for going to sleep and having another war and another war and another war. And I really felt, and here I'm giving a bit of a speech, Asaf, if, you, you know, um, if it's okay with you, but I really feel now that what's happening in the continuation of the, of the war and the continuation of the fighting is that in some way or other, it's building up for the next war. And what happened on October the 7th showed us that we can't keep going like that. It showed us our vulnerability on this side of the border. Israelis are vulnerable too. We're human beings and we are not immortal. And the vulnerability was a, it should be a wake-up call, but I don't really see that that wake-up call is working. Somewhere we should know that there ha there is another way of doing things. So, um, uh, it's a question whether how much the wake-up call is effective. If you ask me what should happen now, today, 
the war should stop, the fighting should stop, no more killing. Today, it has to stop and a totally new direction found using all the avenues that are possible. And there are many avenues and there are many ways forward. And so I feel that we cannot, it's for us as for Israel, as well as for everyone, that our survival depends on not continuing wars, but finding a radically different way of doing things. And we've had wars for 70 years. And it's therefore it shows it hasn't worked. And another war to me is, you know, there's a Chinese phrase that says, if you go for revenge, you have to dig two graves. And I think in a way we're digging two graves here. And that, that's my view. And if we just postpone it for another war, I am fearful for the life of my children and my grandchildren because we cannot sustain an existence here in Israel and Palestine based on only wars and force something it's just digging two graves in my view so um i'm speaking out now that's my feeling and um i i would say one thing for those people that died if they're looking at us down from heaven those people that died in the Gaza border, Otef Aza, and now in Aza itself, Gaza itself. If we come out of this with a radical shift in direction for peace and coexistence, that they can then look down from heaven and say, maybe it was worth it. My death actually made something happen. Maybe it was worth it. I'm not so serious, of course, but um, but as a reason for more killing? No. In my mind, no. Uh, I, I, in a way, hold the same views as you and also the same um, loneliness and uh, something very hard about talking now in the outside in the Israeli society, just saying end the war or all lives matter the same. And um, there is there is a question that I find hard to to answer actually and, and that because we did see a different sort of violence now. I mean, when people say, you know, Hamas is this organization which is actually brutal and and chooses very literally to uh, not to want to live with us in any way. Like it's a real, real enemy. And and then you say just stop the just stop the war. And I say the same thing. And I do hold something within me saying and then what? Like am I willing that they will harm me again, that the war will continue from there. So, yeah, how do you feel about that? I feel that um, there isn't such a thing as a person that is kind of totally fixed and a... Um, kind of them, they're like that, they will be like that, there's nothing we can do, they're always going to be like that. I don't I don't buy that. I've seen enough hugely violent people that change of change of heart. I'll give you an example. We worked uh, for years in and many of you know um, in dialogues with Israelis and Palestinians. And occasionally we did get participants on the Palestinian side who were equivalent to the Hamas. 
they were angry, they were violent, they came in, they were shouting at us, they were shouting at the Palestinians for talking to Israelis, they were shouting to, at us for arriving, for being there, even though it was a peace a weekend. But I, we all, we did manage to talk and the talking and the listening did something. And again and again, we found people who were fundamentally violent, but also in the Israeli side, people that had strong views of that only violence worked. And when you look at that and you begin to listen and you begin to see the pain that is under that and you allow that suffering and pain, something can move in the soul. And I have a pretty clear sense that if there was a movement to peace, if the Israel side said, right, we're ready now, let's talk in any avenue, let's support, let's repair Gaza, let's support the Palestinian people, let's renew things, let's start talking, let's start listening, let's start connection, let's start communication. The, 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 the heart of so many people would change and slowly, slowly, Hamas itself would also change. It will not happen overnight. If someone is totally, totally ready for violence and extreme, yes, of course, this person, and you can't talk to them, they put them in prison. Don't kill thousands of people because of that. If you can't, yes, you should do something to protect life for anybody, uh, anyone, whether Israeli or Palestinian, if someone has is impossible to talk to them and only knows violence, then yes, you can protect life. But I think slowly, slowly, it will take time, but slowly, slowly that will stop. That will change. If, if, the, if the whole movement of peace happened, then slowly, slowly there would be different narratives. So right now the narrative on both sides is only force works. And I agree with you that the force that we've seen, the violence that we've seen uh, against um, Israelis on October the 7th was really extreme. And it just shows the kind of craziness there. They're, they're, they're people with, you know, the mind doesn't work the way we expect. But that doesn't mean to say that people can't change, that something can shift, that the narratives that support that will change. I mean, uh, when there, if there could be peace with Palestinians, I think the voices of extremes on both sides would begin to go down. They would begin to soften. They would see that peace works. They would see that they can bring their children to school, that there's enough to eat that the families can live together, that there is there is something to be really precious to be gained from it. And that would actually, uh, I would, I think, push the extremes on both sides, actually, to being less, having less voice, less control, um, and less extreme on both sides. But it needs a roadmap. It needs intention and clarity. Somewhere or other, people have to have hope. We can't just say, yes, yes, we want peace. What are we doing for it? What will we give for it? There needs to be some real commitment, hunger for peace, deep hunger on both sides, a real, in a way, peace because this is the way we survive. We can't survive without it. And, I, and, and when that hunger is there, um, then things can change. A few questions in mind, wondering what to ask. Um, I heard uh, a few sayings from Palestinians. I, I co-work with Palestinians now on a regular basis. And... Um, one Palestinian, Palestinian said, it's been two months since the 7th of October, and you Israelis don't move on. You keep on coming back to the same place when there is a genocide in Gaza. 
and another per, uh, Palestinian citizen of citizen of Israel who I spoke with, I work with regularly, I um, spoke with just an hour ago, said she's hearing now the voices that she didn't hear, uh, I think, ever within Israel, uh, within Palestinians in Israel, um, saying like Israel is understand only power, only strength, like the same as we Israelis talk about Palestinians and. Uh, that we can't forgive what is happening now in Gaza. And really, the losing of hope, and I feel you talked about, in a way, hope and the roadmap, and I can see now that hope is uh, lacking everywhere now, in all society. And maybe if you have, maybe personally, what, what gives you hope, because I, I do hear your, your voice, which is very important, I think. Uh, it's important to move in that direction. I uh, wonder what gives you hope, whether it's people or Dharma or your anything. Um, I think what gives me hope is a little bit of the sense that we're still human beings. And we are, but we're also reactive human beings. In other words, the first thing we think of is how to protect my life. And so, uh the narrative the reactions create narratives that are based on now what do i need to do to protect my life now and they're very difficult narratives only force works is a narrative what gives me hope is you guys <laughs> what gives me hope is those that actually don't buy into the narrative and they're always there what gives me hope is 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 nelson mandela that arise arose in a somewhat similar situation where there are always people that say wait a minute what narrative are we supporting right now can we change the narrative can we change the way of looking so there's a if so many people are saying only force works only force is 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 relevant then we need to look for those people and listen to those people that say only kindness works and only kindness is relevant and there will always be people who say that and that gives me hope I don't know how long it will take. <laughs> what I can't say is whether it's tomorrow, whether for my children will still be fighting wars, I don't know. But, th but I do know that a human being, and which includes karma, which includes the uh, fact that fate is not written in stone, that everything is fluid and flexible, that amazing changes can happen, and they can happen quite quickly, um, I was born uh, at the end of the Second World War and all the stories I've heard of Britain when I was born and, and in the few years afterwards were people quite miserable. It was dark. It was, they didn't have enough food. Uh, everyone was sad and miserable. But in a few years, Germany became the best of friends. <laughs> And it didn't take long. And it kind of, it maybe it's a ridiculous example, but it does show that things can shift. And, and there are many narratives that are possible. So the immediate narrative that you heard, Asaf, from your Palestinian friend said, only force works, is reactive. And I understand it. And I would meet that person and say, I really understand the way you're feeling. And it really, I understand the sense of, of vulnerability and and uh, and uh, fragility, uh, and 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 that you feel, but that give give peace a chance that there are other ways of doing things, and we need to do what we can to find new directions now, to encourage different ways of doing things, to shift the narrative that instead of only force makes sense. 
only kindness makes sense. And if we keep on with that narrative, we don't know where it will go, but some, some people will be touched by it. And that's the only thing that we can do. It doesn't, I would say, it doesn't give me hope in the sense that I expect something to happen. <laughs> it's not that kind of hope. I think once you, you yourself, actually, Asaf, when we were in uh, Khalil, uh, maybe it was you that was saying there's two forms of hope. Um, one is hope that it will be better which I cannot say I have that hope, but there is a hope which is just the positive heart that says things can be better. It is possible and it has always been possible to choose another way. And that hope doesn't depend on something happening tomorrow or next year or next week. But that hope I do have uh, because I've seen it again and again and I really feel that the human heart has in it the capacity for to be sensible in the end, to want peace, to want well-being. It is there in the human heart and it comes out uh, when it can. So, hear, hear what you say about the changing of narrative, which I think is very radical to say in these times. To really, uh, the amount of violence everywhere is... is uh, not just physically, the violence in the streets and um, speech, how people talk. And I, as, as you know, I have the belief that we need to change narratives, but there's also on the ground things we have to change. And that's, it's not, and that's not very pleasant in a way. And because um, I look at the, at the situation I, and I, if I look at the, the Dharma, I, Fruits arise from their from their uh, circumstances, from the conditions which brought them about. And we've been living in a country that has been becoming very fascist in the last year with a very extreme government that I think many of us are, are working against. Then, of course, also what's happening in Gaza with the Hamas. And uh, it's been two months, and the uh, protests in Israel are quite low. And there's actually no, uh, generally what people are saying is like, this is not time, it is war time. So uh, while it's war time, it should be silent. No. And I find myself in the Dharma community also um, speaking very loudly and going through lots of protests. And, and most of our community is, is very, in a way, peaceful, pleasant but not uh, kind of courageous. And it doesn't have to be courageous, but I wonder, what do you think about what is needed now um, in terms of action? What do you see? What, what kind of, how, sometimes I, maybe one last thing, sometimes I, I feel we don't, in a way, we don't understand, we teach a certain Dharma. We understand Dharma in a certain way, which is actually sometimes counterproductive in some situations, um, which is very internal, psychological, and not seeing our connection um, sometimes. So, and also to say that you've been active in your life for a long, long time. <laughs> um, so you do have the experience. Yeah. Not an easy question. And I don't have formulas um, of a ways forward. But I think, and it may well be that we're a voice in the dark. And it could be that you and I are just crying in the dark. And many of us here together. And that no one's going to listen to us at all. But the only way forward I see for us, for you and me, is to use whatever connections, powers uh, that we have to have our voice heard. And, it's, it, and we, without expectations that the war will stop because of it or anything like that. But it's important that, that we keep that voice going because otherwise, if we feel it's all impossible 
and everyone's talking this, as you say, violent language and so on. Um, we cancel ourselves, we bury ourselves, and we feel the pain, not only the pain of the situation, but the pain of paralysis. The pain of, of paralysis, pain of shituk, pain of being, of, of um, helplessness. So what we can do is look at our circles, wherever we are, wherever our life is, and when people come with violent views or strong anger, we need the wisdom at that place. Again, no protocols, there's no formulas, but we need the wisdom to say, I hear you, I understand you, I feel where you're coming from, but allow me to give another view. There are other ways of looking at things. Can you listen to another view? In some way or other, to say it in a, in a way that is non-threatening and non-violent from our side as well. Just offering, saying, I would like to offer another way of looking at things. And of what we can, and we are, in a way, it's very hard. And we, wait, we, we might not have that language. We might not know what to say. It's all right. But our heart goes out there. And that's, I think, the only thing we can do. We're, we're, we're not, a, you know, in, in politics, we're not prime minister, we can, but we, we all of us have circles and connections and uh, places that uh, will listen to us. And wherever we can, I think we just have to give a different way of looking at things with respect, not being with the language of violence ourselves, but respecting the other, I understand you, I love you, I I see where you're coming from, I really, I, you know, whoever you are, but there are other ways of looking at things, and I think we just have to keep going with that, um, and it's not easy, and as you say yourself, Asaf, sometimes we feel helpless, that we, we're not making, we can't make much difference, I think that the problem you met you mentioned one thing that I do want to address just in a sentence sometimes people in the dharma or really any spiritual uh, journey make a little bit of a mistake in saying that the spiritual journey has kind of truths absolutes call for example nonviolence as an absolute, which is very much part of the Hindu world. But the Dharma doesn't really go there. So I think that uh, sometimes we can get a bit stuck with, well, I'm coming from the Dharma place, or I'm coming from a spiritual place, or I'm a meditator, so I think like this, or I don't, I, I should think like that. Instead of that, the, the Dharma encourages clear seeing, and it encourages a big, open heart and clear seeing of what's happening and it encourages being beyond the identity of me and the other and the labels and so on then that's all about knowing and seeing and feeling with a big heart and a big mind it doesn't say what we should believe that's not a language of the dharma i have to tell a small story which is lovely from uh, ab about this um when I was teaching in uh, the Krishnamurti school uh, in uh, Varanasi in 1991, and I was teaching at the uh, Krishnamurti center there, and we had many workshops over the year that I was there, which were all about different things. And one workshop with two or three days uh, was on uh, violence and nonviolence. And so we had groups and people came from Varanasi and there were monks and there were yogis and there were old uh, sadhus and there were children and there were all kinds of people from Varanasi turned up in these uh, in this workshop. And, and we had everyday groups. So there was one group on violent on nonviolence. And there was an old yogi there that said all this discussion of violence and nonviolence is not relevant to me because I belong 
to the yoga tradition which is totally committed to ahimsa and ahimsa is non-violence in in the sanskrit i'm totally committed we are all committed to ahimsa we wouldn't kill a fly none of us and a 16 year old boy from the school got up and said sir your conformism is violent Beautiful from a 16 year old boy, sir, your conformism is violent. I was like knocked out. It was so such a such a, a wise comment there from a boy. But um, uh, so the Dharma doesn't go into that place of only ahimsa, nonviolence or whatever, but it goes into a sense of, as I say, a big open heart and mind. Um, with which we navigate through the impossible situation of being a human being and trying to survive in this challenging world. It's impossible. We were born into an impossible situation. <laughs> That's samsara. You could redefine it as samsara as impossibility. <laughs> you, you mentioned uh, clarity. And, uh... I have a question of, uh, you know, we talk about the uh, ignorance is the um, the root of, in a way, the root of all suffering is ignorance. And um, there is this word in Hebrew, I couldn't find the translation, hitpakhut. How do you say hitpakhut in English? Um, say it, I didn't hear the Hebrew word. Hitpakhut. Ah, hitpakhut is... Hitpakhut. Yeah, it's a good word actually. It's a very good word for mindfulness. It's it's kind of sobering um, up. Yeah, so waking up. It's it's uh, it's seeing through things. It, 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 yeah, it's a good word. Um, yeah. So so yeah. I, how how most of uh, us uh, most of the when people talk about the uh, hitpakut of sobering up or uh, disenchantment in a way now it's. Um, it's mostly talked about, and now we understand. No, now we really know that there is no way for peace, and that, yeah, that's the real face. Like I heard it today from the Palestinian friend. Ah, this is these are really the Israelis, and now the Israelis know these are really the, and there is no way for peace. And and I wondered personally. Do you have any waking up from any illusion in a way? I'm not saying the illusion of who are the Israelis or Palestinians, but um, I mean, for myself, I can say I felt I had woken up from a certain illusion of what kind of evil actually exists in the world. Like I didn't really realize the amount of evil possible. Like this is a whole new way. And did, did you wake up to anything? from anything to anything. And another question is, do you think there is something that you recognize around you is kind of a prevailing ignorance around us that needs to be seen, needs to be known now, so we can actually move on? Yeah. Um, I think that the uh, it, it's not that I, there is a waking up moment that I had, um, but I had a process. And at the beginning of the process, um, I felt very, uh, I, I felt part of an ignorance, which is, when I heard so many people that were in the Dharma that are were really peace oriented people suddenly talking with another language, saying we there's no other way. They're, they're also that, like you said, your Palestinian friends, I heard also many people around me who I assumed were in a different head coming with that. There is no other way. We have to smash them. So. I, I felt kind of a confusion or a, um, how am I going to deal with this and where am I with that? It wasn't clear to me. And I felt just a lot of pain 
because of it. And I was saying mourning, is, I was mourning in a way, uh, Dharma friends, that suddenly I noticed how much their language had been collected from the communal language, the collective language, the consensus seemed to sweep everybody. And to be honest, I felt some myself not part of the consensus, but rather a bit confused. And then the waking up for me was a sense like, whoa, hit pakhut, exactly. I am not going to be part of this. I felt a real clear clarity that I I have to step out of that and that there, there's no way I could support what's going on now as a, that view that we have no other way. We have to fight them and we have to bomb Aza. So I began to wake up to say this is deep ignorance that the no other way and the bombing of Aza is the only thing we need to do now, I felt was a great ignorance. And there was the morning, and, and, and it made me feel very clear in the sense that this is not the way forward. This is not going to bring back the people that were killed. This is not going to help our survival as in Israel. This is not going to be a good future for my children. This is not going to stop Hamas because there'll be another Hamas coming out of this because of the suffering there. This, the, the whole thing to me was, uh, is, was a no-no. And so that became much clearer after a while. And, and that was the Hidpakut. I'd lost in a way my own personal uh, clarity at the beginning. And, um, and, and then I, uh, I, it came back. Um, as 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 a deep you know clarity which i again i don't expect all of you to feel the same as me necessarily i just see things in a certain way i don't expect everybody to see it in my way um it's not an expectation i have it'd be lovely but i don't expect it um and you asked something else which i i lost the yeah uh, that was personal about, about you and I'm asking if there's something you see in our society that we regard as ignorance, that we, if the society sees it, which can be actually very wide, because I hear about, in a way, ignorance which is in this country, ignorance which is global regarding what is happening in this country, ignorance maybe in Palestine, many things I think that I see, uh, maybe in a way, ignorance that if is um passed away can bring harmony so what should we see in a way yeah yeah it's in a way when you talk about karma or samsara uh yes there's an ignorance there which is very primal which is about survival but it's the interpretation of that survival. For example, people at the beginning used to say to me, well, if a Hamas person came through the door, you mean, and, wa and wanted to kill you and your children, you mean you wouldn't do anything? And it's one of the questions that's impossible to answer. I don't know what I would do. <laughs> um, but um, it's, I began to realize that's not the problem. That's not the problem. The problem is, the ignorance that says, in order to, to, to deal with our fear, we have to make war on the enemy. That's not to stop the enemy. It's to stop our fears. And that I felt there's one ignorance there that wasn't being looked at, which is our fears are producing, again, in a way, over the years, another war and another war and another war because of our fears, because of our sense of being victim, and the other side exactly the same. Another war and another war because of our story, of we are the victim. And that's a huge ignorance. It, it's samsaric, I understand it's there, but it's still an ignorance which is very, very powerful. And, uh, but I said, but as I said, they are, there are other ways of looking at things. And somehow or other, our ignorance is never total. There's always some light 
there's all it's never totally black there's always some light yeah. maybe we'll have one or two questions because it's uh it's okay. really half past eight and um and we said we'd have one or two questions in the chat if you, you can read it you have them in the chat if you want to see them you want to read them i'll uh, be happy if you read to me if you look at the chat and and read what's there so okay so we have um Um, do you think there is an underlying layer of a religious war or a clash of civilization civilizations playing here that was one and again one, one at a time one at a time okay <laughs> uh, and I won't keep I won't make it too long um, I think that that's minor I don't think that uh, I see it as the clash of uh, commu communal and national narratives. So I think there's a Palestinian narrative and a Jewish narrative that keeps being supported generation after generation. And there's, there, there are more uh, narratives that become national narratives or community narratives that then have a certain truth about them. And, I, and and they create the wars. I don't think it's a geopolitical issue. That's my view. I might be wrong, but I, I don't think it's a civilization or a geopolitical. When you go to, you know, whenever I went to the Palestinian areas in the West Bank, I've never been. I have been to Gaza. Yes, we were trying to do some peace work with the with the, the people in Gaza before the hit, the hit not, not kut. Um, but I've in you don't know that you've gone from Israel to uh, Palestine. There's this the houses are the same, the food's the same, the people they look the same. You know, it's not a it's not really a religious. And I'm in the Galilee here with Druze and Arabs, and we're really okay. And the, and the religious yeah, more or less okay, but it's really for many years. So I don't see it as religious or um or or geopolitical. I see it as uh group psychology and the narratives that drive people to say this is the truth and uh and we have to live by that truth and the truth is them they're they're gonna get us if we don't get them first it's this kind of um it's this kind of narrative so there are a few more in the chat but i'll choose just one which is practical uh it's a how can we talk with an, an organization that wants to destroy us? Well, I think it's, first of all, it's already happening through Qatar. So talking has already happened. And we just, that's maybe a tiny little light in the darkness. We just have to keep going with that. I don't, I've heard voices, uh, uh, people from Hamas who are saying, actually, we, 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 we don't have to, we, Israel can exist. We don't all have to say Israel shouldn't exist. So it's a voice of extreme, but I see the voice of extreme will be modified once things change on the ground. Um, so I don't believe Hamas are a kind of a gush or a body that all believe the same and that there's no one to talk to there. This is one of the narratives that's kept things going. There's no one on the other side to talk to. It's simply not true. There is always people to talk to, and there will always be people to talk to, but we have to have the willingness to make the effort. So there's many, many ways we can do this. We can use intermediary. We can use Israeli Arabs to be a link between Jews and Arabs. We can use Qatar. We can use the international community. We can use whoever peacemakers like you and me and all of us here to talk. And it, just have a, a confidence that through that talking and listening, things move, not in one night, not in one day, but movement happens. And then the voices change. And then Hamas will not be the same. And, and, and Israelis will not be the same. Things will change. But we have to make the effort and, uh, and have the courage and the confidence to do things differently. Just to say that we can also imagine 
remember that Hamas wasn't always as it is now. It took a long time for an organization to grow and change, and there's no reason why things shouldn't. As they were, came into being, they can unwind, you know. I agree completely. So, so we, we're going to finish, so I give you the, the permission, or ask you if you want to send us with a few kind words, or promises, or hope, or trust. 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 Yeah, um, each of us, I want to, it's a blessing really, I want to share with all of you, everybody here, that each of us has a big heart and a big soul. We are big people. We know love. We know kindness. And we know our clarity and our awareness. And our, the blessing is keep coming back to that big heart and big soul that we are. Keep remembering that in all situations in life. And from there, we act and we speak and we talk as, we, as feels right for each of us. There isn't a formula, like I said before. Stephen is saying what Stephen needs to say. Asaf is saying what Asaf needs to say. Zuzi, you're saying what you, you need to say. Each of us is saying what we need to say in our lives. But we have to have a kind of a ground. And the blessing is that our ground is a big being that we are. And from that ground, we contribute to ourselves, those around us, and everyone we meet in life. Amen. Thank you, Stephen, for coming. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody, for joining. And, Thank uh, you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Obviously, hope you see good, happy oh, day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.